the title of most beautiful car will never be one of objective fact. Though plenty of frontrunners vying for it exist and likely will exist, differing opinions always get in the way save for arguably one. The Jaguar E-Type is the end result creating the people sports car with Le Mans racing technology. Jaguar's race winning D-Type would help provide the basis of their new mass production challenger, with longtime designer Malcolm Sayer once again utilising his experience of aircraft streamlining, helping pen the radical newcomer through the little known, more simplistic 1957 E1A prototype before further developing the car. In spite of the E-Type's brand spanking new look though, things underneath were kept more traditional. Lurking behind the vast bonnet was the same straight six Jaguar used for its predecessor, the XK150, with not so much as an update of power. That said, while its engine came from the past, the rest of its engineering proved to be much more appropriately forward thinking. A 150 mile per hour top speed, all around disc brakes and independent rear suspension kept the E-Type firmly ahead of Ferrari, Maserati, Porsche, and even Mercedes, the future looked bright. In March 1961, Jaguar's latest contender debuted at the Geneva Motor Show to instant admiration, with Enzo Ferrari of all people spearheading the hype by famously proclaiming it the most beautiful car ever made. So popular were test drives with Jaguar's latest champion that a second convertible version was raced out of the Coventry factory by test driver Norman Dewis through the night all the way to Switzerland to meet the rushing torrent of demand. From then on, the E-Type became a motoring staple, the 60s effortless grasp of style. Unsurprisingly, this, coupled with the fact that it was far, far more affordable than the equivalent Ferrari, made it trendy enough to wind up in the hands of the famous and the wealthy. Over the course of seven years, the original Series 1 E-Type found itself tinkered with and adapted. In 1964, its engine was updated from 3.8 to 4.2 litres, which granted a boost in torque. Then, in 1966, a 2 plus 2 variant was added to the coupe and cabriolet lineup with the option of an automatic transmission. During this time, further modifications were made as a means of appeasing US regulations before Jaguar finally caved and gave the E-Type a proper updating. The Series 2, introduced in 1968, could only be seen as something of a weaker, watered-down version of its predecessor. It was detuned for a change of carburetors, dropping torque and power from 265 to 236 brake horsepower. The glass headlamp covers were abolished, it was given large indicator lights, had a larger mouth to improve cooling, and the tail lights were moved under the bumper. While some modifications made it an improvement over the original incarnation, the Series 2, with its smaller power and speed, is regularly seen as a less desirable. Three years later, Jaguar continued to plow on with its once game-changing creation, despite being a decade old and not much better for it. That said, it seemed the Series 3 would be a wildly extensive update, particularly beneath the skin. After extensive service, Jaguar's trusty straight six was thrown out in favour of its new 5.3 litre D12. Derived from the prototype Le Mans racer, the XJ13, the latest D-Type would also receive upgraded brakes and standard power steering. On paper, it sounded like a large upgrade. Sadly, its appearance didn't quite reflect that. The small yet noticeable changes to the bodywork somehow made a once beloved design look less of a classic and more of something pretending to be a classic. What's more, the V12 only made 275 brake horsepower, just 30 more than the Series 2 and a mere 10 more than the Series 1. In spite of Jag's efforts, the E-Type looks simply out of its depth, out of its element, and out of its time. A painful irony underlines the E-Type's fate, starting out as a sports car ahead of the curve and winding up old and behind the times by the end of its life in 1975. The point where British motoring was right in the thick of hitting one low point after the next. Fortunately, the E-Type's end isn't quite as sad and morose, and oddly, it goes back to 1962. Back then, management were looking into a D-Type spirited racer that used elements of the road going E-Type. This one-off low drag coupe, as it was called, utilised aluminium instead of steel and a tuned version of the tried and tested 3.8 straight six. Despite its creation, Jaguar didn't do much with it, and sold the prototype on a year later, where it would pass hands throughout the decades. But that wasn't the end of specialist E-Types. In 1963, Jaguar developed the lightweight E-Type, an aluminium-covered evolution of the low-drag one-off with the standard road car engine ramped up to over 300 brake horsepower. 
Originally, 18 cars were planned, but instead only a dozen were created, and whilst they were entered in races such as Sebring and the good old Stomping Grounds Le Mans, the lightweight only really took victory in smaller events under private hands. Today, this variant is fairly sought after, to say the least, but even those wealthy enough or crazy enough to fork out the right price will find them hard to come by. Two were known to have been smashed beyond repair, while another was rebuilt. Nevertheless, chances are that all the working examples are under lock and key with their current owners. But then in 2014, over 50 years after the lightweights were built, Jaguar's heritage business made its plans known in building the remaining six cars and finally reaching the previously planned total of 18. Needless to say, these exactingly made cars would cost one shiny penny, but with them the story of the beautiful, influential E-Type comes to something of a more positive, nostalgic close on what stands as very possibly the pinnacle of motoring design. Just don't expect it to start the first time. And that was A History in Motoring.